Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Alders and um, just, uh, for letting me do these. It's not easy for me to come out of my comfort zone, and uh, this is one way to do it. Unlike uh, Rich and Steve, I get to pre record mine and give them to Kathy, so this might be the 25th take, you never know. But um, that being said, we're just going to get started because it's a little bit long, right around 15 minutes, but um, I'll try not to keep you too long, but we're going to talk about forgiveness, but however, getting into forgiveness, you jump around a lot with repentance too, so it's going to be a little bit about both. But um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and we're going to stop right there because we're starting in Leviticus. Uh, we're going to start in the Old Testament and work our way to the New Testament. The uh, Israelite refugees find out what God expects from them. Now, they were camped out at Mount Sinai at the bottom. Well, they were camped out at Mount Sinai. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Leviticus 11.44 God isn't asking them to be perfect. If he were, he could have skipped the sacrificial rituals he had set up so people could get forgiveness when they had sinned. Instead, he is asking for devotion. Then he shows the Israelites how he wants them to express that devotion. Leviticus shows how to live in the presence of a holy God by obeying him in such matters, sacrificing animals, eating only kosher foods, observing holy days, and getting rid of ritual impurities before worship. By obeying these rules, the people express their devotion to God. This is what he wants from them. In return, he promises to protect and bless them. You will eat your fill and live securely in your own land. That's in Leviticus 26.5. So we're going to talk about the sac sacrifice of animals. If an animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defect. Lay your hand on the animal's head, and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. Leviticus 3 for 4. Leviticus begins by explaining... The most important ancient Jewish ritual is sacrifice, that the Israelites express to God their gratitude for blessings and their remorse for sin. In the eyes of a holy God, sin is a capital offense. It has been that way from the beginning. God warned Adam and Eve, and we all know what happened from that point. During Exodus, God sets up a sacrificial system. He offers to accept the death of animals as a substitute for sinful human beings. The life of the body is in the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible, Leviticus 17:11. The bloody ritual also serves as a reminder of how serious sin is, serious enough to warrant death as a penalty. So God sets up several types of offerings. Now I'm gonna stop there, because even in the Old Testament, um, God wanted us to be forgiven. So he sets us up. He's an amazing God. Burnt offerings. The Israel's most common sacrifice. The worshiper kills and burns an animal on the altar. This purifies the worshiper of sin. Rich people kill a bull. Most other people kill a male goat or, or sheep. Poorest people kill doves or pigeons. Then we move on to grain offerings. Grain offering from the harvest is brought as thanks to God. Worshippers can present it as flowers, flour, baked goods, or roasted kernels. And the priest burns some of it and keeps the rest as a salary. Then we have peace offerings. A worshiper burns part of an animal as an expression of thanks to God. And he eats the rest of it often with his family and friends. And then we move over to sin and guilt offerings. These animal sacrifices purify a person who has committed spe spe specific types of sins, such as stealing, lying, and unintentional sins, such as making a rash promise that is impossible to keep. O Israel, God says, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay, Jeremiah 18, 6? This single line from a message of, this single line from a message God sends to the Jewish people could sound reassuring, a reminder that God is in control. But the message comes from an unsettling scene at the potter's shop. The potter working at his wheel doesn't like how the pot is shaping up, so he smashes it into a little ball and starts over. God has started over before. The flood was a redo. Humanity had become so sinful that God decided to start again with his family, one righteous man, Noah. God offered to start over with Moses after the Israelites worshipped the golden calf at the bottom of Mount Sinai. 
leave me alone. So my fierce anger can blaze against them, God tells Moses, and I will destroy them. I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. That's in Exodus 32.10. But Moses convinced God to, to give the Israelites another chance. Even now it's not too late for a nation to repent. It's never too late. If I, if I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, God says, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy them as I had planned, Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8. Yet most of Jeremiah's prophecies sound as though the smashing of Judea is a done deal. Does that mean the reference to God's possibility is changing his mind and escape clause Jeremiah inserted? In case of the Babylonians, don't come. When we keep reading on, we will see that the day of the smashing is near, and we see why. The Jewish people hear God's offer to forgive them, but they reply, Don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as the way we want, stubbornly following our own evil desires. That's in Jeremiah 18.12. It's not too late for Judea to repent, but God knows it's not going to happen. And he knows that nation needs a big event to serve as a lesson for future generations. Erasing Judea from the map qualifies... I will pardon my people's crimes, which I have not yet pardoned. I, the Lord, will make my home in Jerusalem with my people. That is Joel 3, 3.21. Whatever happens to the Jews, whether whether or not they have to suffer punishment and invasion, Joel has described destruction isn't the last word. At some point, the Jews will come to their senses. They will repent. God will forgive them. And that's the word right there, forgive. And the relationship relationship between them and God will be revived. God promises I will drive away these armies from the north, Joel 2.20 These are all Joel I will give you back what you lost 2.25. I will gather the armies of the world. I will judge them for harming my people, uh, 3.2 So even after all the bad things the Jews have done to done to God, he still forgives them and we still and we as a nation still have hope so now we move forward to the book of Matthew. At some point, we skip the next 30 years in Jesus' life. Matthew to the start of his ministry. Marked by two events, baptism and temptation. Matthew in 3.13 says, Jesus went from Galilee to Jordan River to be baptized by John. Perhaps the biggest question is why Jesus bothers with baptism. A prophet named John the Baptist is baptizing people who confess their sins. They get baptized in water symbolizes the spiritual cleansing of God's forgiveness. However, the Bible portrays Jesus as the Son of God who came to take away our sins. And there is no sin in him, 1 John 3, 5. Even John the Baptist says so and tries to talk Jesus out of baptism. And, and so Jesus says to John the Baptist, we must carry out, this is important, we must carry out all that God requires, Matthew three fifteen, as this is God's plan of salvation which involves Jesus taking responsibility for humanity's sin and then taking the punishment, which is death. By stepping into the water, Jesus confesses the sins of the human race as though they were his own sins, or is he just showing us this is the path we should all take? Here are a few, few verses from the book of Romans about forgiveness and being patient. Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? And that's in Romans uh, 2, 4. And um, again, in Romans 4, 5, people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. The book of Romans has so many good things about God's forgiveness, his patience, and how he wants us to become Christians and live like him. Let's move over to 6, 16, Romans. It says, don't you realize that you become a slave as whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave in sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey to obey God, which leads in a righteous living. This is the Bible. And lastly, they, uh, in the book of Romans, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Romans 2.12, or 12.2, I'm sorry. So now we're going to move over to the book of Colossians. We just keep going toward the New Testament. So while Phil is in prison, Paul wrote letters to the Ephesians and the Philippians. In those letters, he states back to the Colossians, Since you have been raised a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. 
Paul says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. That's in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. So bottom line is we need to put God first. Jesus phrased it in this way. Seek the kingdom of God above else and live righteously. Matthew 6, 33. Sorry. After all, after all, isn't it God's will for you to be holy? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. So let's move on to Luke 23, 32. It says two others who were also criminals were being led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place called the skull, they were crucified with him. The criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they not know what they are doing. And that right there hits me. Uh, I believe the book you're looking at says, For the night they do not know what they, what they do, and they cast lots, dividing up his garments amongst themselves. And the people stood by, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, the Christ, the, the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, then save yourself. But for our sins, mine and yours, he carried out God's plan of salvation. That's communion to me, right there. That's communion. That means the most to me uh, out of this whole thing. If you take anything away, that's why we have communion. He did all that, and he still asked them for forgiveness. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that who, who so, so ever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life, 316. And I want to leave you with this from the book of James, 19 through 20. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and has been brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings that sinner back will save that person from death and bring about forgiveness of many sins. Thank you so much. We miss you guys. Uh, looks like things are heating up again, so we'll see what happens. But um, I'll be there if they allow me. We love you, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Good night.